Pacific map, you can see the Straits of Malacca, um, where it starts, South China Sea starts with the Straits of Malacca, and then it goes on towards Taiwan. Then you have East China Sea, which is a tension between China and Japan, the Senkaku Islands. Um, you see North Korea up there. So North Korea, the Korean Peninsula has Yellow Sea. Yellow Sea is not mentioned there, but for the, for the issues that I'm going to discuss, Yellow Sea is important because there's uh, weapons trafficking happening. It's just not um, a North Korean uh, nuclear tech power. And then you have the Sea of Japan, and beyond that, it's Russian borders. So Indo-Pacific covers Russian borders as well. Then you have the next map, which shows uh, the claims of uh, China. This is the nine dash line, which covers almost all of the South China Sea based on historical claims, historical civilizational stake of the Chinese uh, race in that part of the world. This is the official uh, map used uh, in the West by media as well as Western analysts, um, particularly because uh, it shows clearly that the Spratlys is closer to the Philippines. It shows the, the archipelagic nature of the Philippines. Uh, and this is very important for discussion on internal waters of the Philippines. Um, Indonesia has the same problem of internal waters and archipelagic waters. Then it, um, the, the claim is very close to the EEZ of Vietnam, the exclusive economic zone, and the parasols. So the whole of this area is South China Sea, and Taiwan is in the South China Sea. So this is um, the, all the wars that have happened, which I won't go into, but this is a quick uh, capture of uh, the figures by CSIS on the defense spending, which is again important because it, this um, research attests to the arms race that is going on um, in the region. You can see uh, you know, the, the Indo-Pacific borders with the numbers, um, how much Taiwan is spending, Japan, Russia, and China. These are important um, players in the South China Sea. Uh, very often, um, South China Sea is just regarded as a unilateral action by China, but there are other forces at play as well. Uh, uh, go back a step. Uh, what are these legends on, you know, like for all those members, there's a little logo or something. What are, what are we talking about here? We are, we are talking about naval, submarine, and airstrike capabilities. So the top left, tell us, point to these little legends, these little logos, and tell us what each one represents. Well, these are uh, nuclear-powered ICBM-capable missile launch submarines. These are naval uh, vessels with air carriers and missile strike capabilities, and these are um, um, bomber jets with, with and without uh, missile capabilities. It just depends. So, so the number is Army and Air Force. These are personnel Mark, attached to these, these units or what? No, the, these are defense spendings. Yes. There's a what? Defense spending. Defense spending. Spending in dollars? In dollars, in yes. Dollars. In arms dollars. Arms. There's an arms race going on in this region. So, um, and then this region, this is the trade flow, this is the mercantile route, um, and then very quickly I'm just juxtaposing that mercantile trade route with uh, the, the 21st century maritime silk road that is being envisioned, it looks very similar. If you can notice, there's a comparative map. This is the uh, trade route of uh, the oil shipment, which is worth about $3 trillion, of which 1.3 is headed to American ports. Now, when I say North American ports, it includes uh, the US as well as Can Canadian ports. Uh, so. You've got this map, and so this is a comparison of um, trade routes, oil 
shipment routes as well as uh, the, the, the 21st century maritime Silk Road uh, blueprint. Okay, so, and this is how Eurasia is envisioned by the Russian International Affairs Council, and I'll leave that for now. Oh, there's one more thing that I would like to uh, note. Um, so the way that the region is envisioned from the Second World War to now has differed because this is the Indo-Pacific strategic art of the Australian defense based on its white paper in 2013. This is an arc of containment, nuclear containment, um, based on the figures that you saw, the defense spending that you saw on nuclear-powered uh, equipment across the South China Sea. So with that, um, I'm going to begin my paper. Asserting peace traditionally has been about deterrence through show of military might, particularly about nuclear deterrence. Though legal mechanisms and policy instruments for diplomatic negotiations are fundamental aspects of international relations, there has been very little consideration to the question on what is the normative order of peace. Or simply put, what is peace? The question is not about the multivalent pathways to a truce in various situations of interstate conflicts. Neither is the question about the routes or the roadmaps to building peace in a war-ravaged land or frontier. Although the question is indeed connected to all these processes of peacekeeping and peace building. The question on the normative order of peace is on the principles of relationships and on the tenets of recognizing collectivity, cooperation, and collaboration rather than singularity, exclusivity, or groupism. If the basic principle or norm of interstate or interregional and communal peace is coexistence, then what developmental process of community building or nation building contributes to rivalry and to hegemon? The techniques of governance of a nation state and nation building has historically been conceived in full relation to the art and craft of making things, techne, the Greek etymological root of the modern concept of technology, include, and, and this includes rhetoric, uh, tools of ordering such as numbers, calculations, instruments of comfort, convenience, culinary experimentation, self-protection, defense, and weapons of war. To both the Greek tradition of Plato in strategizing the Republic and to Sun Tzu, the most popular among ancient Chinese strategists, as well as in the Latin tradition of Jus ad bellum and Jus bellum justum, the art and craft of war was primarily not about the deployment of weapons or the clash of men in battlefields. The use of weapons in all three Eastern Persian and Western traditions were manifest precipitations of an eventful failure to win by the principle of coexistence, to win by talks primarily in order to avoid the clash of communities and deployment of weapons. Sun Tzu's popular quote, quote, the, uh, the open quotes, the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting, close quotes. Plato's reinforcement of Socrates' didactic principle of avoiding war as an evil while propounding the peaceful way of life as a fundamental virtue, and the morality inherent in the modern version of Jews at Bellum of the Geneva Conventions in reasoning out and avoiding the start of a war, all of these attest to the historical norms of engaging in peace, in supporting coexistence and avoiding the show of offensive weaponization and military strength, while all three traditions have their own philosophies and justifications of self-defense. Is it not in the pursuit of self-defense, however, that a political culture of weaponization evolves into an offensive capability? Although technocratic capability is not equivalent to aggression or use of force, technocracy or a culture that fosters a competitive age by merit of innovative technological systems denotes power in action, as all technological systems are not static, but are kinesthetic ex experiments in a continuum of improvisation and modernization. 
A brief overview of nuclear histories of various nations since the Second World War would reveal an underlying insecurity of a threat by another nation or a group of nations that are either perceived as being technocratically dominant or aggressive in action. E.D. Abraham argues while exploring nuclear histories of post-colonial and developing countries in the time period of the 1950s to 1970s and 1990s that there was ambivalence on national nuclear policies at the initial developmental phase, but the ambivalence on interconnecting nation building with nuclear power disappears in countries where the initial experimental and developmental stage progresses to actual acquisition of technological capacity through interstate partnerships in design, economic support, and even collaborative development with multinational groups of scientists and engineers working together to produce bombs and missiles. India's nuclear partnerships with the US for nuclear reactor designs and technical development since the days of Nehru, despite a public policy stance of non-alignment and intermittent Russian leanings of certain political factions, the American history of French and British scientific collaboration in the Manhattan Project of the Second World War, Chinese cooperation with Pakistan's nuclearization around the Indo-Pak and Indochina wars, Vietnamese Soviet conne um, connections and trade in nuclear arsenal, and subsequent post-Cold War leanings to the US for missile defense, Chinese, Pakistan, and Russian aid in design and financialization of North Korean nuclearization. All these attest to selective cooperation and transnational groupism in building multilateral security architecture. The philosophical underpinnings on the normative order of peace as coexistence and cooperation has not disappeared, but has become manifest through long history of conflicts and coalition as selective partnerships, as multilateral trade alliances and interregional free trade, even while there is interregional and interstate security mistrust. Writing on, quote, core security interests of the great powers, unquote, in North of 60, which is a CIGI publication, Rob Hubert states, quote, Russia is building up its submarine forces in the region to maintain its nuclear deterrent, and the US is building up its anti-ballistic mis missile capabilities in Alaska to defend against North Korea. There are not Arctic machine, uh, uh, sorry. These are not Arctic missions, but still require substantial forces to be placed in the Arctic. As the overall core security needs and interests of the US, Russia, and China continue to diverge due to reasons far removed from the Arctic, the strategic importance of the Arctic will continue to increase. Hubert goes on to explain that while some class of nuclear arsenal um, was reduced through the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, both the US and Russia have continue to modernize their nuclear-powered submarine capabilities and nuclear warheads even after the Cold War. Now, while retention of the nuclear stability has always remained a core security requirement for the Russians, as Hubert points out, the, U the US has been steadily focused on the Arctic as an area of operation for the US Navy's SSB and nuclear-powered submarines carrying nuclear ballistic missiles. He goes on to state that the US has, um, has also transformed one of its Cold War base at Fort Greeley, near the Canadian border, as the most important element of defense against North Korean missile threat. And the US is reportedly increasing their capability to in intercept missiles every time North Korea improves and tests its nuclear ability to fire missiles at North, uh, at North America. And for that, I have a map. Um, so technological advantage to grow, a, oh, um, so the Arctic um, security defense is actually against North Korea and threats coming from elsewhere. So that's the logic. Now I'm going to skip some passages because there's not going to be enough time. Technological advantage to grow a weapons program, however, does not necessarily equate to an economically advantageous state as evident in North Korea. In fact, economic disadvantage, economic sanctions, embargoes, and isolation in trade or a group of nation states can spur an aggressive resilience or even an offensive policy stance from a nation's 
from a nation state's leadership that is made to feel repressed or suppressed and insecure of its own regime survival as manifest in North Korea. North Korean Foreign Minister has stated his nation's justification towards the nuclear arms power as a response to regular US South Korea military exercise in the region. As Pilahari Kausikan, former diplomat with the Singapore's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, explains, Pyongyang is convinced that it will not survive unless it acquires ICBMs. However, Kausikan points out that North Korea currently, as of April 2017, does not have, quote, nuclear armed missiles capable of reaching the continental US, unquote. Yet the state leadership of North Korea is relentlessly on its path to improvising its missile capabilities, which is a threat not just for the US, but for US allies neighboring South Korea and Japan, which are in closer range than the US. As Kausikin states, failure of disarmament of North Korea put South Korea and Japan in line of developing missile capabilities. Even while nuclear missile technology is often viewed as instruments of deterrence that impose a suspended continuum of uneasy peace in face of an impending threat by the technological dominant nations, there's very little consideration that military security has contributed to human insecurities. The global paradox of security is one that hinges on the dialectics of military security versus human insecurity. The quest for technological protection in the pursuit of self-defense amounts to competitive acquisition of nuclear systems for peace, preventive and preemptive strikes, and it is this competitive pattern of national quest for nuclear and military security that is paradoxically challenging the collective peace of all. Until and unless there's a comprehensive ban on all nuclear armaments and use of chemical and biological additions to the nuclear arsenal, there is the imminent global risk of rivalrous and repetitive patterns of show of force by not just any one particular state like North Korea or confederation of states of the Shanghai Cooperation of the Russian Counter Security Organization of the former, former Soviet allies, but also by non-state actors operating from dubious zones of conflict and peace building. As Kausikin as proposes, one way ahead to prevent nuclear terror in Northeast Asia is to get both the US and North Korea to negotiate a bilateral agreement that promises North Korea of its regime survival, but quote, in return for a verifiable freeze on warhead and missile development, unquote. In an astute diplomatic vein, Kausikin highlights the political uncertainties for such a move. Quote, the two big uncertainties about the approach are first, at what level of warhead and missile development would Pyongyang feel secure enough to agree to a fr freeze? Second, would such a deal be politically sellable in Washington, Tokyo, and Seoul? My own argument here is to revive the failed six-party talks and assure North Korea upon the condition that it gives up its missile development program, that the North Korean regime will be assured trade, investment, and re regime recognition on the world stage as a manner of coexistence and peaceful cooperation while maintaining UN monitoring and surveillance mechanisms on any covert missile operation or program. Would a peaceful and unified Korean Peninsula in alliance with the US coexist with current Russian aspirations for Eurasia is another problematic question as Russia and North Korean relations has been tutored as a love affair. While China and North Korean relations is long-standing and the most financially rewarding of trade partnerships for the latter, Russia and North Korean relations have been strategic and not just limited to missile program support, but also closely connected to the trilateral infrastructure pro project of regime Pesan Railway interlinking Russia, North Korea, and South Korea. Seoul has recently called for halting the interconnected railway project in response to Pyongyang's missile launch test in March 2017. Yet, Russia continues to be North Korea's partner in Siberian oil supply, which North Korea is reported to process in local chemical plants and resell the surplus to China. But little is known about the nature and the variance of these chemical substances. China has reportedly been frustrated about North Korean missile building program as it's not just 
Korea, but also China that is being included in the range of the U.S. TAD, Terminal High Altitude Area Defense. The U.S. defense mechanism that is due to be installed in South Korea to shoot down ballistic missiles coming in its direction. Nevertheless, China's partnership with North Korea would also be an impediment in addition to Russo North Korean strategic partnership in negotiating a possible US North Korean bilateral peace agreement. Why? China North Korean partnership has ideological connections. Not all of it is stemming from technocratic weapons development or trade advancement. As Gaussman has already pointed out, the Chinese Communist Party can be expected to have enduring empathy for their Leninist neighbor. A special report in The Economist also carried similar views, starting North Korea exasperates Chinese leaders, but yet they feel that they must show uh, the solidarity to a former ally against America in the bloody war North Korea launched in 1950. China would rather have a nuclear North Korea under Kim Jong-un than a failed state sending millions of desperate refugees across the Chinese border. Above all, it is troubled by the idea of a unified democratic Korea with American troops next door, close quote. But to sum up Russia or North Korean conflicts and tensions with the US as communist, Stalinist, or Leninist versus liberal democracy would be oversimplified. While ideological clashes are one level of examining the problem, it does not provide a complete analysis. There are more factors motivating the nation building and expansive influence seeking aspirations of nations. For instance, the China dream of Xi Jinping which integrates infrastructural project of the One Belt, One Road with a multilateral security architecture that connects Asian economies with European trade, with China playing the central role, role in the Asia Pacific bridging east-west trade and shaping world order. And then there's Putin's Russian vision of Eurasia economic union with Russia governing the interconnected political economies of that region. China has now, furthermore, positioned itself as a near-Arctic state even though Arctic does not feature as part of the original Chinese blueprint of the 21st century maritime silk routes. Though China has been engaged in Svalbard and in Arctic missions closer to Svalbard uh, with the Chinese icebreaker Su alone um, sailing the Arctic passages since 1999, the arrival of five ships, naval fleet of the of, of Plan, People Liberation Army Navy in Alaskan waters in September 2015 marks a clear stance on a tip for tat response to the U.S. freedom of navigation operations in the Indo-Pacific, particularly in the South and East China Sea regions. Even though plan is now not deployed, um, not deployed in the North American Arctic as a provocated force, Herbert North's Quote, but when taken into consideration with China's increasingly aggressive actions in the East China Sea and South China Sea, this northern deployment is difficult to view in isolation. It is unlikely that this is a one-time event. It's unknown whether or not they intend to provide their submarine forces with a capability for under ice operations. If this was to happen, the arrival of plan SSMs would substantially complicate the maritime strategic picture for the Americans, Russians, and Canadians. My argument on this is the strategic picture for the Russians and the Chinese across ocean frontiers of Eurasia and the Arctic may converge, at least not diverge much. According to Michael Alessandro, the head of the Center for Military and Political Studies at the Moscow Institute of International Relations, Russia is the only country court I'm quoting him. Uh, Russia is the only country selling modern weapons technology to the Chinese. Were it not for Russian assistance, China would be lagging significantly behind the West aircraft and cruise missiles. Russia and China have a treaty of friendship and cooperation in which there is an article on consultations in the case of a threat to one country and in the case of conflict with the US, Russia may provide assistance to China. The treaty allows for such an eventuality. Alexandra State Close quote. Alexandrov's statement are uh, even more explicit on the geopolitical uh, directions of China. Quote, the Chinese took full advantage of the conflict between Russia and the West. American resources were diverted to the European direction into Syria, Turkey, and Ukraine. There was even talk of the possibility of war in Europe. The Americans escalated the situation around the Baltic. They overlooked the fact that China might be strengthened as a result. Beijing saw the US resources were concentrated elsewhere and placed aircraft and air defense systems in the South China Sea. Close quote. 
As for the US, neither the Kissinger style triangular diplomacy of balancing Soviet American rivalry by opening up trade relations with China, nor the Wilson school of imbuing morality in peace and in war against communist regimes, nor the Bruce Will manner of strategizing interstate relations based on resource needs and supplies predicted a Sino Russian convergence in expansion across ocean frontiers. After the Sino Soviet split in 1961, relations were tense, and then I go on to the history of it. Uh, and then when it comes to Tiananmen Square, China changes directions because Europe of European embargoes and starts buying weapons from China. I mean, China buys weapons from Russia. So, um, so North Korea, and I'm, I'm jumping to North Korea again, North Korea is a small portion of the One Belt on Road project as a neighboring Leninist country to be interconnected with railways, most of the terrains to be, uh, and most of the terrains require maritime connection uh, before they lay roads. They have to connect through um, the seas before they go inside. Simply put, 70% of the global ocean waterways across archipelagos, reefs, rocks, and islands require interconnectivity before tar and cement roads are laid in the interior parts of the lands of Eurasia. But there are two major problems for Chinese policymakers in actualizing this major maritime project proclaimed as China's new millennial 20th century maritime silk roads. So according to the Russian um, news, Beijing and Moscow have indicated that they've reached a consensus on integrating China's plan with Russian Eurasian Economic Union. Echoing a similar view, Reuters special report on the subject of Sino-Russian cooperation across Asian and European frontiers quoted the Chinese foreign minister. And this is the foreign Chinese foreign minister by his quote. The culture and historical genes of one belt, one road come from the old Silk Road, so it takes Eurasia as its main region. So this is the basis on my further analysis. Um, so, they, um, so I go on to state that they have two major problems in, in, the, um, in implementing this um, old project, which is primarily based on uh, the 21st century maritime silk roads. And they have two problems. The, the first problem is the India-US relations and joint forces dominance in the Indian Ocean region and the South China Sea. Um, extending to Taiwan, and then the microphone. Yes. Should, should wrap up. okay. And then the um, then then there's the Australian defence uh, strategic arc that I showed you earlier that complements the pivot back to Asia. Then the second problem that um, that is an in, uh, impediment to. The, the, the effective occupation of the South China Sea is the Vietnam-US Defense Pact. Um, and then I talk a little bit about the American pivot to Asia rebalancing, which I can read out if you want in the uh, question time. I also go into the due regard and due notice of the clauses of uh, UNCLOS. Interestingly enough, uh, UNCLOS does not outlaw uh, uh, artificial islands. I mean, they are, they are not illegal, but they have to give due notice and due regard. But uh, China's construction of artificial island building uh, by sand dredging and land reclamation activities and militarizing them have been unilateral. Where China fails is to, uh, is to engage in joint development of the region by getting prior bilateral and multilateral consent. Then there are some... Um, uh, you, you, I mean, if, if you've read my Rutledge paper, I um, uh, exposed the presidential statement three upon ratification, whereby they, they customize and class the international treaty process based on the, uh, the domestic, Article 2 of the domestic territorial sea law, where they claim the entire parcel and even the archipelagic waters of China. Clearly, China is not an archipelagic state. Um, so then, 
Um, I go a little bit into uh, saying that the I explore, so the five peace frameworks that I've explored, I read out the conclusion. Um, but clearly there's, uh, I go into the testament that ha uh, US Admiral Harry Harris uh, talks about the nuclear risks in the South China Sea and for upgrading the US Navy. And so that's on its way. Um, and then I also say, okay, just give me five more minutes. <laughs> and so, so the peace that exists by an increased show of military strength by the world's nuclear nation in the South China Sea is at best a management of escalation of conflicts into war. The Code of Unplanned Encounters at Sea, a non-binding agreement that the U.S. forged with 20, 21 Pacific powers, including China, is more of a justification for encounters that can be unplanned and sudden rather than a multilateral truce. Asserting peace in the South China Sea cannot be about how and when encounters can be planned or unplanned. Harmonizing the sport in the South China um, um, Sea requires a geostrategy of peace. Asserting peace in the South China Sea uh, is more about the containment of violence, should be more than the containment of violence, and should be about the management of instability. There's one regional peace pathway to counterbalance the rebalancing of military might going on in the South China Sea. And this peaceful path exists uh, despite the failure of COC and DOC. We can discuss that, why I say it's failed. And this is the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. It's a treaty that China, and both the China and the US have signed with ASEAN. And, uh, and that treaty calls for peaceful behavior in that region. So now I come to, uh, after discussing TAC, which is the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, um, I go into, on these fronts of geostrategic and normative cooperation, the options I see are by ways of comparative lessons for forging diplomatic and legal precedents. Number one, firstly, managing instability and uncertainty over the, sta over the status of internal waters requires lessons from Canadian diplomatic cooperation, particularly one peaceful um, cooperation over uh, Northwest Passage in the Arctic. In the case of the Canadian Arctic security, Michael Byers, has already made a useful recommendation. He has declined because of um, family reasons that he couldn't come um, from Vancouver. Made a useful recommendation to update the 1988 bilateral agreement with the US to a certain Canadian internal waters and make provisions for the US safe passage, right of transit, and freedom of navigation. This, he claimed, would set a legal precedence in other parts of the world to exercise bilateral agreements with selective partners on transit, transit and safe passage. Given the insecurity and instability in the, um, in the South China Sea region, this normative order of a bilateral agreement over Canadian internal waters <coughs> would set a legal precedence for crafting a bilateral agreement in the South China Sea region, particularly for safeguarding the internal and archipelagic waters of the Philippines and Indonesia from being ravaged by state parties external to the agreement. Artificially transform lake regions of any state party that is the seven cluster of China's islands that are transforming international waters in the EEC of other countries into a private national lake. So that's what I go into. Artificially transform national lake regions of any state party would have no legal status in the context of recognizing natural regions of, nations, of a nation's internal waters as subject of bilateral agreements. By reference to the Arctic, I'm not in the least bit suggesting that the nature of the problems or the root causes are similar to the South China Sea or the Indo-Pacific. But in the context of the state actors being the same in the Indo-Pacific as well as the Arctic frontiers, with China's near-Arctic stance positioning plan, um, the, the People Liberation Army Navy, as a legitimate presence in Alaskan waters and indeed in the Canadian waters, it would be a constructive way forward to explore mutually supportive mechanisms that can serve as comparable legal mechanisms. Second, is a comparative lesson from the multilateral and multi-stakeholder regional council of the Barrett Sea. Heather Nichol has already recommended a multi-stakeholder Beaufort Sea regional council based on the model of the Barrett Sea regional council. This multilateral governance and administrative regional body under a multilateral treaty could also serve as a legal precedence to setting up the South China Sea Regional Council with distributed decision-making powers involving South 
Southeast Asian coastal states, as well as other maritime states and their corporate representatives engaged in joint development of natural resources in the region. These normative constituents of an enhanced peace framework based on regional models of bilateral and multilateral agreements in addition to international treaty instruments need to be considered simultaneously with the provisions for banning nuclear weapons and all armaments of mass destruction, including trade and deployment of biological and chemical weapons. The five normative peace frameworks that I have discussed so far intended to develop a matrix of peaceful cooperative mechanisms, each complementing and strengthening one another, uh, the normative US North Korea peace agreement, the current strategic Indo-Pacific arc of containment, asserting TAC, Treaty of Amity and Cooperation in the uh, South China Sea, and comparative regional models of legal architecture that could effectively pave the way for constructive bilateral and multilateral governance of not just interstate maritime disputes in the Arctic, or the SES or the Indo-Pacific region. These five peace frameworks are effective routes to also governing mercantile and maritime routes from weapons and human trafficking and for establishing transfrontier partnerships in combating crime and terrorism. For them, furthermore, it is now a good time on the 150th anniversary of Canada to develop new and renew all bilateral frameworks for Canadian Asia Pacific security engagement across Indo Pacific frontiers with the core interest of mitigating threats from elsewhere to the Canadian Arctic. Thank you.